Hello and Merry Christmas. Uh, the Christmas season is finally upon us. I don't know how you feel about that. I'm a big fan. Okay, I, I love Christmas. I'm a Christmas fanatic. I love everything about Christmas, so I'm, I'm super excited that the Christmas season is here. Uh, I love the Christmas season, or as uh, oftentimes it's called in the church, the Advent season. Uh, Advent simply means the arrival or the coming of something. And so, of course, the arrival of Christ, the, the coming of the Messiah, uh, happens at Christmas is what we celebrate um, at Christmas. And so it's often called the Advent season. Sunday, November 27th is the first Sunday of Advent season. So, you know, there's often some uh, some debate on how early can you start celebrating Christmas? When can you put decorations up? When can you start listening to Christmas music? You can have that debate on your own, uh, but as, as far as I'm concerned, on Sunday, November 27, 2022, you can officially start uh, celebrating Christmas if you haven't already because it's the first Sunday of Advent. It is the first Sunday uh, in the Christian calendar of, of the Christmas season. And so I'm excited. I'm excited because I love Christmas. However, as much as I love Christmas, and again, I love everything about Christmas, the decorations, the trees, the music, everything. My fear is sometimes that we get so caught up in all the other stuff, we forget to remember what Christmas is really all about. And so we want to start right here at the beginning of the Advent season, and we want to talk about the meaning of Christmas, what Christmas is truly all about. Again, all that stuff is fun, decorations, trees, lights, but what's Christmas about? I want to read a scripture for you, or with you today. If you have your Bibles, go and get your Bibles out, because we're going to use these a good bit. But we read this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. The scripture says, she, speaking of, of Mary, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is what Christmas is all about. It is about the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to save us from our sins. Okay, And this is what we celebrate. This is why we celebrate Christmas. However, one of the challenges is, especially if you've been a believer for some time, or even if you just celebrated Christmas for some time, We've heard the Christmas story so many times that sometimes it kind of becomes old hat, right? It's like, oh yeah, I've heard that story before. I've heard about uh, Joseph and Mary. I've heard about um, the shepherds. I've heard about the angels. I've heard about the wise men. I've heard about the manger. I've heard all that. In fact, it kind of reminds me of watching an old movie, maybe one of your favorite Christmas movies, right? You come home, you turn on the TV, and one of your favorite Christmas movies is on, and, and so you have it playing in the background, but you don't really pay that much attention to it because you've seen it so many times, right? You, you already know. And so maybe you watch for your favorite parts, uh, but you're not really worried because you know what's going to happen. You know how it's going to end, and so you're not really committed to it. It's just kind of going on in the background. I think sometimes if we're not careful, that's what happens at Christmas. We get so busy doing other things that the, the true meaning of Christmas, the Christmas story, if you will, is just kind of going on in the background. Yeah, yeah, we know it. We heard about it, the shepherds, the angels. We've heard all that before. But we don't really tune in. We don't really give it our undivided attention. And so this Christmas, as the season is beginning, as Advent is here, we want to do just that. We want to tune in. We want to give the Christmas story our undivided attention. In fact, let's, let's take just a moment real quick and, and let's pray that we do that this Christmas. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to come to you today, Lord God. We want to thank you for your son, Jesus. We want to thank you for his birth. We want to thank you for this season where we celebrate the incarnation, the time, the moment when God became flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, I pray that we don't let it become just something that's going on in the background. Lord, let us not become preoccupied with other things, but let us truly tune in and focus on you and the celebration of Jesus this Christmas. In your name I pray. Amen. So, how are we going to do that? How are we going to tune in this year and really focus? Well, I want to start by talking about something that happened before the angels, before the shepherds, before Joseph and Mary. I want us to talk about prophecy. I want to talk about the prophecy of the Messiah. You see, while Joseph and Mary may have been surprised 
when the angel visited them to tell them about Jesus. And while the shepherds may have been surprised, and maybe even the wise men were surprised, and Herod was definitely surprised, God was not surprised. This was not a surprise to the Lord. In fact, God had been planning for this for ever, right? Literally since before the beginning of time, God had been planning for this moment. You see, nothing surprises God. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is sovereign over all things. So God knows everything. Um, in my opinion, nothing proves this more than the prophecies of Christmas, the prophecies of the birth of Jesus Christ. With the birth of Jesus Christ, the birth of the Messiah, we have God fully demonstrating his sovereignty over all things, his complete and total control. And I want to show you what I'm talking about as we begin this Christmas season. Let's go back to before the birth of Jesus, and let's look at how God was preparing the way for the birth of Jesus by looking at some of these prophecies. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and get it out. I want, you to, I want you to get a Bible. If you don't pause this video, go get you a Bible. Because I want to show you something. If you have your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 1. If you have Matthew chapter 1 right here, what you have is you have the New Testament on this side, and you have the Old Testament on this side, right? The Old Testament is everything that happened before the birth of Christ, right? And the New Testament starts with the birth of Christ and tells us what happens after the birth of Christ. It talks about the life of Jesus, the crucifixion, uh, the resurrection, the start of the church, all that. Now, there's a common misconception among a lot of Christians that the Old Testament was God's plan A and the New Testament is God's plan B. So there's this misconception that God tried things the old way. He tried Israel, he tried the sacrificial system, he tried the law, and that didn't work. And because that didn't work, he had to flip over here to plan B, and plan B was Jesus. That couldn't be further from the truth. Okay, could not be further from the truth. Close your Bibles. This is plan A, right? The entire Bible is about Jesus. That is something that you need to understand. The entire, entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the whole thing is about Jesus. Okay? Israel wasn't plan A and Jesus is plan B. Jesus was always plan A. From before the dawn of time, God knew exactly what he was going to do, and Jesus was his plan. And the entire thing is about Jesus. Genesis is about Jesus. Exodus is about Jesus. Leviticus is about Jesus. I could go on, but there's 39 books. I don't have that much time. Whole thing, whole Old Testament's about Jesus. Whole New Testament is about Jesus. And I want to demonstrate that for you today with some of these prophecies. Uh, you see, before the arrival of Jesus, the Jewish people had what we call the Old Testament. They, it was just their Bible, right? The Old Testament. But they called it the Tanakh. Now, why was it called the Tanakh? Uh, Tanakh is an acronym uh, based on three Hebrew letters, uh, Tav, Nun, and Kof, or T, N, and K, if you transliterated them into English. And each letter stood for a part of their Bible. So the T, or the Tav, stood for Torah. That's one part of the Old Testament. The N, or the Nun, stood for the Nevi'im, which is the prophets. That's another part of the Old Testament. And the K, or the Kaf, stood for the Ketuvim, which is the Hebrew word for writings. So the Old Testament was divided into three sections. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Now, don't, don't lose me because I'm speaking foreign, foreign languages here. Okay, hang in with me. Hang in. All three parts of the Old Testament are about Jesus. The law is about Jesus. The Nevi'im, the prophets, are about Jesus. The Ketuvim, the writings, are about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. And I want to show you this because I want to show you some prophecies that we find in every part of the Old Testament. Again, their Bible, the Jewish Bible before Jesus, was the Tanakh. It had three sections, and every section is about Jesus. Okay? So let's start with the Torah. The first section of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, was called the Torah. Torah just means a law. And it's all about Jesus, right? Um, the very first prophecy, in fact, that we find about Jesus comes in Genesis chapter 3. This is the very beginning, right? Adam and Eve fall. They, they give in to temptation and they obey Satan. And we see here in Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, we see the first prophecy of the Messiah. Let's look at this. 
Genesis 3, verse 15. The scripture says, and this is God speaking to, uh, to, uh, to the serpent in verse 15. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, this is very subtle, so don't miss it, but it's important. In the first half of verse 15, the word offspring is plural, meaning that Satan and human beings are going to be at war with each other, right? So God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. So the first offspring is plural. Humanity and Satan are going to be at war with each other. We've seen that play out over the past thousands of years, right? However, in the second half of verse 15, the pronoun becomes singular. It says, he shall bruise your head. So God switches from talking about the human race to talking about one specific descendant of Adam and Eve. So Satan and humanity are going to be at war. That's plural. But then he switches to the singular. But he, singular, shall uh, shall, uh, crush your head. So he switches from speaking... Humanity, plural, to this one singular descendant. There's going to be one descendant of Adam and Eve that will defeat Satan. Well, who do you think that descendant is? That is the Messiah. In fact, Genesis 3.15 is known as the Proto-Evangelium. It means first gospel. It's the first hint that we get of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Um, Michael Radelnik, uh, who was a Jewish studies scholar, uh, raised in a Jewish home uh, by Holocaust survivors. He converted to Christianity after studying not the New Testament, but the Old Testament. He converted to, converted to Christianity after studying Old Testament prophecies. In about 3.15, about Genesis 3.15, he writes this. When the text says, He will strike your head, it means that a particular future individual descended from the woman will strike the head of the tempter. Moreover, the blow given by this individual is not on a descendant of the tempter, but on the tempter directly, which points to its supernatural longevity mentioned above. Okay, this is huge, right? Because this is Genesis chapter 3. This is before Moses. This is before the law. This is before the temple. This is before the sacrificial system. God's original plan, according to Genesis, was that there was going to be one individual descendant of Adam and Eve, who would defeat Satan. And of course, we know now that descendant is Jesus. Okay, that's the very first prophecy we find all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Now, as I said, that's kind of a subtle prophecy, and and maybe you like your prophecies a little more specific. You like your prophecies not so subtle. Okay, we've got that too. That was in the Torah. That's in the first section of the Old Testament. Let's jump to the second section of the Old Testament, the Nevi'im, which means the prophets. And let's look at what the prophets have to say. The prophets get real real specific. If you like specific prophecies, the prophets get real specific. Um, Starting with the passage that Matthew quotes, uh, there's a quote from uh, the prophet Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was a prophet living in the 8th century B.C. So this is over 700 years before Jesus was born. And no one disputes this, right? Christians, non-Christians, everyone agrees that Isaiah wrote Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was born. So what does Isaiah, a prophet writing 700 years before Jesus is born, what does he say about the birth of the Messiah? Let's look. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This one you may be more more familiar with. Isaiah verse uh, chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the prophecy that Matthew quotes when he is telling uh, Joseph what to name Jesus. You're going to name him Jesus. He is going to be Emmanuel. All right. That's all in, in the book of Matthew. Prophesying. The virgin birth, 700 years before it happens, okay? Prophesying a virgin birth, something that had never happened before and has never happened since. That's pretty specific and supernatural. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, that's just amazing. And it's all part of God's plan. All part of God's plan, all right? So in the Torah, 
the first part of the Old Testament, we see the prophecy that there's going to be a single descendant of Adam and Eve who is going to destroy Satan, that's Jesus, in the Ketuvim, the prophets, the prophecy section of the Old Testament, uh, you have a prophecy of a virgin birth. Now let's turn to the third and final section of the Old Testament, the Nevi'im, which means the writings. Oh, excuse me, let me back up. I, I want to give you another one from the prophets. So I did one from the prophets, from Isaiah. Let me give you another one from the prophets, the Nevi'im. Uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is another, again, real specific one from the prophets. Micah 5, 2. It says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Now Micah, also part of the prophets, uh, also 8th century, so again, 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And what does he prophesy? He prophesies that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. He names the city that the, the Messiah is going to be born in. Um, and that's not all. Not only does he tell us that he's going to be born in Bethlehem, which, which is absolutely true, but if you look at the second part of that verse in Micah chapter 5, 2, it says this, "...whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days." In other words, Micah says that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem and that his birth is not his actual beginning because he has no beginning. Right? Did you get that? It says, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. That's another way of just saying from forever past. The Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, but that's not his beginning. He, he existed before his birth. Right? You can't be talking about anyone other than Jesus because Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he is part of the, the Trinity. He is divine. He has no beginning and no end. And so, yes, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. That's when the incarnation happened, when God took on flesh. But he wasn't created at that time. He existed before then. So in the, the, the Nevi'im, the, the prophecy section of the Old Testament, you have a prophecy about a virgin birth. You have a prophecy that the Messiah will be born in a specific city, the city of Bethlehem. And you have a prophecy that he's uh, eternal, basically, that he has no beginning. It's pretty specific stuff. Now, let's keep going. Now let's jump into the, the final section. The final section of the Tanakh is the Ketuvim. Ketuvim is the Hebrew word that means writings. Um, among others, this section in the Old Testament includes books like Job, Psalms, Proverbs. All of those are in the Ketuvim section, the, the writings section. And so I want to call your attention to Psalm 110. Um, psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. It is a psalm about the Messiah. And we know this is the case from looking at the very opening verse. So look again at this passage, uh, or look with me at this passage. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. It starts this way, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now the psalm begins by saying it's a psalm of David, so David wrote this psalm. We often skip that part because we don't really care, but it actually really matters here. So David wrote this psalm. King David, the king over all of Israel. He is the author of this psalm. And what does he say? He says, the Lord says to my Lord... But who is David referring to? Well, you may notice, if you look in your, in your Bibles, you may notice in Psalm 110, where it says, The Lord says to my Lord, the first Lord is all caps. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Says to my Lord, and that one, only the L is capital, and the rest is lowercase. Again, you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, nobody cares. <laughs> but it matters. Okay, why does it matter? Because it those words are actually translations of two different Hebrew words. When you see the word in the, in the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is a translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh. That is the personal name for God. The second Lord, only the L is capitalized, that's a translation of the Hebrew word Adonai. And it's just a generic term for Lord or Master, Boss, if you will. So when you understand that, what David is literally saying is he's saying, and where he says, the Lord said to my Lord, he is saying, God said to my Lord or my master. 
So God, Yahweh, said to my master. Okay, now stay with me. I told you, you know, this is a little deeper. I understand. It, that matters because David was the king of all of Israel. And the king of all of Israel is saying to God, God said to my Lord. So the, the Lord is over David. So you kind of have just three steps here. David is here, and he's saying, God said to my Lord. But who's David's Lord? It's not God, because he's already mentioned God. God said to my Lord, but David's the king. So who's David's Lord? It's the Messiah. He was referring to the Messiah. This entire psalm is about the Messiah. Again, Jewish scholar Michael Radelnik writes, This psalm can be divided into three units of thought, each describing the messianic son of David. The first three verses um, are about how he is the divine king. The central verse identifies him as eternal priest, and the final three verses reveal him as a victorious warrior. The point is the entire psalm is about the Messiah. Jesus Christ is all through the Old Testament. The Messiah is all through the Old Testament. We read about him in the first part of the Old Testament, the Torah. We read about him in the second part of the New Testament, or the Old Testament, excuse me, the, the Nevi'im, the prophets. We read about him in the last part of the Old Testament, the Ketuvim, the writings. When you look at the Old Testament, the entire thing is about Jesus. It's about the coming of the Messiah. And there are, we just looked at one, two, three, four. We looked at four prophecies, okay? That's all I've got time to look at today because there are just so many. There are so many prophecies. Not only was his birth prophesied, his death was prophesied. The whole Old Testament is about Jesus. So this Christmas, as we begin to celebrate Advent, as we begin to celebrate the birth of Jesus, I want us to understand this wasn't God's plan B. This wasn't God saying, oh my goodness, the Old Testament didn't work. The law didn't work. The sacrificial system didn't work. Now I've got to come up with something new. No, Jesus was always the plan. From before the dawn of time, God knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to create, create humanity. He knew they were going to fall. He knew they were going to need a Savior. And he knew he was going to send his son, Jesus Christ. And so if he knew that before the beginning of time, we shouldn't be surprised that the entire Old Testament is preparing the way for the Messiah. Your Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is about Jesus. The whole thing's about Jesus. The Old Testament's about Jesus, all three parts. The New Testament's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So it's Christmas as we celebrate. And again, have fun. Decorate a tree. Listen to Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. You know, exchange presents. Go drive around your neighborhood and see Christmas lights. Do all that stuff. But as you do, remember, the whole thing's about Jesus. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus Christ who came to die for your sins. The whole Bible's about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. So this Christmas... Let's make it all about Jesus. Let's worship him. If you're watching this and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to pick up the Bible and start reading it. The whole thing's about Jesus. And it will lead you to a saving knowledge of him. I hope you have a great Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again. Lord, thanking you for who you are. Thanking you for your blessings. God, thanking you for your son, Jesus. Thanking you that... Uh, you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, while the shepherds may have been surprised and Mary and Joseph may have been surprised, the wise men may have been surprised, Herod may have been surprised, you weren't surprised. God, because you had been planning for this since the beginning of time. And we can trace it all throughout the Old Testament. Lord, we thank you for your prophecies. We thank you for these prophecies that give us confidence in your word. In your name I pray. Amen. Again, thank you so much uh, for joining me, and I hope you have a very Merry Christmas.